With Paris liberated, the war in Europe seemed to be over. The Allies now turned their attention to the Pacific. It was estimated it would cost over 1 million American casualties to invade Japan. The best scientists were brought together during the top secret Manhattan Project to study fission and develop the first atomic bomb. Fission is a reaction which splits an atom's nucleus in a chain reaction, releasing large amounts of energy. Two bombs were dropped over Japan, which led to their surrender and the end of the war in 1945. In this video, you'll learn about nuclear reactions in both atomic weapons and nuclear power plants and how they've shaped the modern world. Before I start discussing chain reactions and all these crazy things about fission and fusion, you have to understand the four fundamental forces. So they are electromagnetism, sometimes it's referred to as the electrostatic force. There's also the weak force, which I won't really discuss. And there is gravity, and of course the strong nuclear force. Electromagnetism is responsible for the repulsion of protons. So like charges tend to repel each other. So as we start discussing fission reactions and fusion reactions, just understand that protons in the nucleus want to repel each other because they have the same charge. Gravity is the weakest force, but it also acts at the longest distance. Think about skydiving, for example. One moment you're in the sky, but because you're in Earth's gravitational field, eventually you'll hit the ground at some point. The strong force, sometimes known as the nuclear force, is the strongest force in the whole entire universe. This force is responsible for keeping the nucleus together. The protons, remember, have the same charge and they want to repel but the neutrons exert the strong force which holds everything together. The basis for nuclear weapons relies on the strong force. If you can split an atom's nucleus, you're releasing the strong force and a large amount of energy with it. It took four years for the Manhattan Project to figure out fission. So what you have right in front of you is an isotope of uranium called uranium-235. This is known as enriched uranium and you have to process this from natural uranium ore. So it's really difficult getting this stuff. Now, over here, I have a neutron gun, and when I hit this red button, it's gonna fire a neutron into this nucleus. And I want you to observe what happens. Okay, so I fired the neutron, and now the uranium absorbed that neutron, and the mass went up by one. Okay, so it went from uranium-235 to 236. And this form of uranium is highly unstable. So it will split, so it separates, and it also releases a lot of energy in the process too. I don't know if you can see the faint like yellow like energy sphere, but there's a lot of heat that's released in this reaction. There's also two fission products we call it. It's barium and krypton. These two are released, but more importantly, three other neutrons are released from this reaction and these three neutrons can collide with other uranium 235s okay so if you have a lot of uranium 235 in a critical mass you can have a sustained chain reaction that releases a huge amount of energy here's a chain reaction so i'm going to slide this thing over and we're going to have a hundred nuclei of uranium 235 Okay. And all it takes is just one of these to split. And remember, the three neutrons will collide. And they release more neutrons after they split. And more neutrons and more neutrons. And you get something that looks like this. Okay, This is a chain reaction. Okay, so I fired my neutron bullet into one of them. There it goes. And you set off a chain. The most common isotope of uranium is uranium-238, and this is found naturally in uranium ore. This is the most common isotope of uranium, and this is non-fissile uranium, so it won't undergo a chain reaction because it actually can't split. So if I fire a neutron at 238, it just becomes uranium-239, and 239 is actually stable and it won't split. Okay, I could fire at this one. I could aim and fire here. So it's not setting off a chain reaction like you saw earlier. Oops, I missed. Right, so it just absorbs the neutron and nothing happens. Obviously, fission is a problem 
because it has led to the creation of atomic bombs, but it has beneficial uses in the modern world as well. So this is a nuclear reactor. It's a model of a nuclear reactor, and I could slide this control rod in and out. Okay, so without the control rods, let's just see what happens. So if I just fire some neutrons, okay, the power output is tremendous. Okay, so this is a runaway chain reaction. And this is what happened at Chernobyl, where you had a chain reaction that could not be stopped, and it led to a nuclear meltdown. And there was a release of a lot of radiation all across Europe from this one accident at Chernobyl. Now, the control rods can actually help mitigate this problem. Okay, so it's a balancing act where I want to create energy Right? And if I stick these control rods in, it actually prevents the neutrons from uh, reacting with these other nuclei that are over here. Okay, and So that's what the control rods do. They prevent the reaction from running away. Right? You don't want to run away chain reaction, otherwise you have a nuclear meltdown. Now, if I have the control rods in all the way, I can't really produce the amount of energy that I want. Right? I have to like constantly like fire neutrons and there's no like chain reaction, no true chain reaction that's taking place. Now it's it's again it's a delicate balancing act of making sure your control rods are in the right place at the right time. It's important that you understand a chain reaction. So in short summary, you have enriched uranium, which is uranium 235. You fire a neutron at it, that 235 absorbs the neutron and becomes uranium-236, which is unstable. Because it's unstable, it splits, and when it splits, it releases a large amount of energy, and in doing so, it also creates two fission products, barium-141 and krypton-92. It also releases three neutrons in the process. Those three neutrons can then go on and they collide with other uranium-235, starting a chain reaction. You can think of fusion as the opposite of fission. Fission involves the splitting of nuclei, whereas fusion combines these protons together to create energy. This is how the sun creates most of its heat and its light. The sun is roughly 73% hydrogen, and every single second, it fuses 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium, converting mass into pure energy. The sun is mainly hydrogen, which are just one proton apiece. So remember, protons have the same charge, so they tend to repel each other because they both have positive charges. Now, with the immense heat and gravity of the sun, it can actually fuse these protons together, forming helium, and in the process of doing so, it releases a lot of energy. Einstein came up with an equation which can help explain how the sun converts a little bit of mass into a whole lot of energy, and that equation is E equals mc squared. Energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. So let's just pretend you have one kilogram of matter, and we multiply that by the speed of light. The speed of light is 300 million meters per second. It's super fast. So if you take 300 million and you square it, you get a really large number. You get 9 times 10 to the 16th joules of energy. So on the sun, you can convert a little bit of mass into a huge amount of energy. All right, that concludes my talk on the atom part four, which covered fission and fusion. Most of these questions I answered already during this video. If there's anything that I left out, make sure you read over the packet that was given to you. What are atoms and how do they react to make a class we call chemistry? So this one is super helpful. It gives all the answers. Okay, so just go through the notes again, fill in all the stuff that you just learned about. Okay, and try the fission activity for yourself too. So the fission activity was this thing. Make sure you go through all the tabs and just try it out for yourself. There's a lot to learn. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on Wind Chemistry.